right, good morning. Really cool to have you all here. Happy Wednesday. Hope you had a great three-day uh, break and stuff. Just like Kayla, if you have your quiz, I'd love to have it stuff. That would be awesome. Uh, Wednesday, you have uh, till uh, this afternoon if you want. But anyway, uh, so turn your quiz. This Friday, if you have lab on Friday, we'll do the second midterm. We won't have a problem set or a quiz this week. It'll just be the second midterm. Uh, you'll turn in the exam prep two, <clears throat> the lab we did last week, the determination, ASP, delta G, delta H, and delta S for calcium hydroxide. Too many words, so I just abbreviated it. Uh, but we do, this Friday, do the QA1 lab, and I'm really excited to share this lab with you. This is a lot different than the other labs we've done. Uh, no math, <laughs> no measurements, oh my gosh, no sick things, oh, I'm shaking in my boots. No, uh, seriously, it's kind of a fun lab, all right? Well, all right, I think it's fun, what you think, I'll, I'll, I'll let you decide. But anyway, when you come this Friday, <clears throat> if you have safety goggles, definitely bring them along, some kind of protection. Also, please do not wear open-toed shoes, all right? So no sandals, you know, tibas and stuff like that. Yeah, tennis shoes, boots, anything that's closed over. Once in a while, I've had people spill chemicals. They don't hurt themselves, but they go on their feet and it can sting and stuff. So, so if you have closed-toed shoes, that would be really neat. Um, I'm going to do an exam review for the second midterm. Uh, this is going to be just a one-day review, which is not really what I intended to do. If you want to see the full version, uh, there is a website link for it. It's mhchem.org slash v slash z dot htm, all right? And uh, if you write it down and it doesn't make sense, you can email me and I'll send you this link directly. But this would go through the full version of this midterm review. So this will be a one day review. Uh, so we have a few other things to do. <clears throat> we're basically down, <clears throat> excuse me, to the last two weeks. So we're getting down there. Hang tight. Any questions on anything? Let's do it. All right, so we'll do what we can of the review. Now this review will be over solubility. It'll be over the thermodynamic stuff, so delta S and delta G, delta H, blah, blah, blah. And then it will be over electrochemistry. And I'm just gonna start with the solubility and go as long as I can with the time I have, so. And of course, if you have questions on anything, please let me know. This first question is kind of a kickback to Chem 221. Uh, and it's basically just, you know, will you have a solid form? Will you have a precipitate form? And this is one of those things and stuff you can just kind of throw together. What's really important for this question and for the lab this week is we're looking at what's called the silver group, which is the group one cations. So the lab this week is QA1. The one stands for the group one or the silver group of ions. Silver plus, mercury two two plus, and lead 2 plus are the three in the group one cations. And those three are very insoluble when you have bromide, iodide, or chloride. So for this one, the answer is a resounding yes, all right? Anytime you have lead 2 plus in the presence of chloride, bromide, and iodide, you will see a salt. Now, most of the time, chlorides, bromides, and iodides don't make solids and stuff. But in the presence of group one cations, lead two plus here, silver plus, and mercury two two plus, you will see a solid form. And we're gonna use that lab today to isolate these three ions and figure out if you have them or not. Any questions? Okay. Here's a question uh, that's more likely a uh, type of thing we've been studying. It says we have here an example of the solubility of barium fluoride. Solubility is by default in moles per liter. So the question is, what is the KSP value for this particular compound? So see if you can figure out how to go from solubility to KSP. I'll give you a few moments here to think about that.
I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Um, if you have your eye put, you're always participating. It doesn't matter. Solubility is what uh, people use when they want to know how much of the stuff will dissolve in so much water. So what this number is saying right there, the 3.6 times 10 to the minus 3, is you have 3.6 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of barium fluoride dissolving per liter. Now solubility is different from KSP. KSP is the product of solubilities, go figure. Anyway. But what you can do to think about this is that little solubility I refer to a lot of times as X. And X moles per liter, 3.6 times 10 to the minus 3, represents how much of that will break down per liter. Well, if X moles break down, that means because the stoichiometry is one to one, you'll have one barium two plus for every one barium fluoride. But because of the two right there, you're going to have 2x fluoride. So fluoride will be twice the amount uh, that you have there. But the cool thing is here is that we have now the ions in terms of solubility x. So Ksp will be x for the barium. It'll be 2x for the fluoride, but we square it. And so 2 squared is 4 x squared times x is x to the third power. So to solve this one, take the solubility, raise it to the third power, and then multiply it by 4. And if you do that, uh, I had 1.9 times 10 to the minus 7. So if you know that your compound, your element, is a 2 to 1 ratio, like 2 anions, 1 cation, or sometimes you'll have 2 cations and 1 anion, then the solubility X is related to KSP by this 4X cubed thing. And that can be kind of helpful. Um, this is the number you would need to figure out like how many milligrams dissolve per million, stuff like that. You can convert them over. But KSP values like this one are often listed in tables with chemistry. So if you have a KSP, you can convert it back to solubility, et cetera, et cetera. Any questions? Okay, here's a question that makes you think a little bit again about the equilibrium constants and what they mean. Now this whole quarter we've seen how as K gets bigger, more product, and as K gets smaller, less product, all right? All solubilities should be listed as the solid is the reactant and the ions that go into it are products. So the question is here, which one has the greatest solubility in water? See if you can figure out which one of those three it should be. So these KSPs <clears throat> are not solubility directly. But like we talked about in lecture, you can often uh, rethink about KSP as a way to figure out solubility. But as K gets bigger, and this is the biggest one, you should have more product. That means more ions. That means more soluble uh, species. On the other hand, as K gets really small, and some of the KSPs are super small, like I saw one the other day that was like 10 to the minus 71, and I was like, whoa! But anyway, as K gets smaller, you have less ions and more solid. So by default, the bigger K should be the most soluble, and that's what everybody saw, which was really cool. Now technically, solubility would be the square root of these KSPs because one of these breaks down to X and X, so it would be KSP equals X squared, and X is the square root of KSP, but 99% of the time, uh, yeah, literally KSP gets bigger, more soluble, KSP gets smaller, less soluble. 
questions? Okay, here's a kind of compound, uh, kind of a question you'll see. We have two calcium salts. Calcium salt with KSPs less than one means that they're insoluble, all right? They're going to make solids pretty readily. And so in this problem, we have close, but not quite the same, uh, solutions with sulfite and sulfate. So you can see the sulfate is a little bit bigger, but they're both pretty much the same. And we're slowly adding calcium as a solid, and so it doesn't affect our equilibrium is what it comes down, the uh, moles per liter. The question is here, which one precipitates first, the sulfite or the sulfate? So see if you can use the ideas we just talked about to figure out which one would be seen first if you could add really small amounts of solid. Let's visualize what's happening here. You start with a clear solution. It's got a sulfite and a sulfate. Anything with sodium and potassium, it's gonna be aqueous all the time. So no solid appears. Then we start adding solid, a source of calcium ion, and then all of a sudden a solid appears. And we're trying to figure out which of these is the solid we would see first if we added it very, very small quantities. So earlier in the last one, we talked about which one was more soluble, and we talked about how bigger K means more soluble and smaller K means less soluble. So this is the bigger K, 10 to the minus five is bigger than 10 to the minus eight. So that means the sulfate is more soluble. But that also means for this problem that the sulfite is less soluble, all right? It's gonna appear first. So because this is less soluble, it's not gonna take that much calcium to make it precipitate out. And in this one, that sulfite will be the one we're gonna see first. So in the thing I just described, all right, I just looked at the KSPs. And as long as your solutions are about the same and the kind of questions you'll see this week, they will be, uh, then yeah, KSP is gonna be the dominant force. So 10 to the minus eighth is much smaller than 10 to the minus five. That would be a great way to answer this question. I don't believe you, Dr. Russell. Oh, fascist student in the back of the room, always wants the math. Seriously, you can do this with math too. All right, so you don't have to take my word for it, but if you, you can actually figure out the calcium ion concentration from the KSP. So like this number equals calcium ion times sulfate. And if you solve for the calcium ion, all right, which is what I did right here, you get 1.3 times 10 to the minus seventh moles per liter and you do the same thing for the sulfate, the calcium is 10 to the minus five. So if we're really able to add small enough quantities of calcium, this is the one that's gonna make a solid first. It only takes that much to make a solid. You're gonna to have to go up a couple orders of magnitude from 10 to the minus seven to 10 to the minus five in order to see the calcium sulfate precipitate out. So, any questions? Okay, so going along with that, all right, we saw that the calcium sulfite precipitates first. This is a common extension question that you'll see with these kind of problems. So the question is, all right, we now know from the last problem that the calcium sulfite is going to precipitate out first. It has a smaller KSP than this one, so that means it's gonna make a solid. So the question is then, what is the sulfite as the calcium sulfate, this one, begins to precipitate. 
Now here's why this question is cool, all right? We calculated earlier how much calcium it needed to make this one precipitate, and it wasn't a very big number. It was pretty small. Well, in theory, you as the chemist then could add more and more calcium and have more and more of this precipitate out and get just to the point where this one begins to precipitate. And if you filtered or, or decant, which means pour the liquid off while keeping the solid in your container, then in theory, you could isolate the calcium sulfite from the sulfate. Your sulfate will still be 0 0.30, but your sulfite will hopefully be a lot less. So you wanna calculate here what the sulfite concentration is as this one begins to precipitate. So in a nutshell, solve for the calcium here once again, and put that calcium back over here to find what the sulfite is. So I'll give you a second to think about that, and uh, we'll talk about how to solve it.
this is a question on how chemists separate things. And so we have here a solution with both a sulfite and a sulfate, and somebody says, oh, Clifford, we gotta get these separated. And at first you might think, oh yeah, no problem, just, you know. But anyway, it's actually a little bit more complicated than you might think. So what we're trying to do here is add a calcium ion source, calcium nitrate or whatever. And we're trying to figure out which one of these, first of all, precipitates first. And we saw that smaller KSP is almost always the one that precipitates first. And that's what we saw in the last slide. But the question is now, we're gonna raise the calcium past the point of this one precipitating and just up to this value. And as we do that, a lot of the sulfite is forming calcium sulfite, which is a solid. So if you raise it up to the level where this one precipitates, we're curious how much sulfite is left, like it was 0.1 moles per liter, all right? Um, mathematically, it's not very hard to do, it's just kind of confusing with the words sometimes. You take the more soluble KSP, which in this case is 2.4 times 10 to the minus five, and you divide by the concentration of the sulfate that you start with, which is 0 0.30. And that's gonna give you some amount X. <clears throat> that's the amount of calcium that's required to make calcium sulfate precipitate. And whatever this number is, now we're gonna throw it into the KSP for the sulfite, the less soluble example. So here's the KSP for the calcium sulfite We'll divide it by the calcium that's needed to make the sulfate precipitate, and that's gonna be the value. And whatever the number is, we're gonna hope, and it, it will be, that it's a number less than 0 0.10 moles per liter. So that's chemist's way of saying that you've separated something out. So in this problem, when you do all these steps, it comes out to be 1.6 times 10 to the minus four, all right? and chemists will pat themselves on the back because we started with 0.1 molar sulfite, and if we get the calcium up to the level where the other one just begins to precipitate, sulfite is dropped to 1.6 times 10 to the minus four. So chemists were like, yeah, good job, we separated it. But as the knowledgeable consumer slash scientist ambassador, you need to realize here, it's not zero. All right, it's a number that's a lot smaller than it was, and that's good, but it's not zero. And that's where you have to think about, is it a safe thing, a safe amount to have? And that's gonna vary each condition. Any questions on this? <clears throat> Here's a question. We keep running into pH, I know. I'm kind of tired of it too, to be honest. But anyway, we can actually figure out the pH based on KSP. Now this is the KSP for magnesium hydroxide, which is a good source of hydroxide. And you wanna find the pH of this solution. Now, because this is a pH of something with a hydroxide, do you think the pH is gonna be greater than seven or less than seven? Greater, that's right, that's right. So use that as like a goal here and stuff to think about uh, what the pH might be.
Okay, so on this problem, we're trying to find the pH of the solution. And as you know, pH is mostly about either hydronium or hydroxide. And hydroxide is directly part of this KSP. Now like all KSP expressions, the solid is the reactant and the ions that go into it are the products. So in this case, you'd have magnesium two plus and two hydroxides on the product side. And as we talked about earlier, for every X moles of the solid that break up, you'll have X moles of magnesium, but you'll have two X of hydroxide, all right? So when it comes right down to it then, KSP is gonna be X times two X squared, or KSP equals four X cubed. And the first thing you should do is solve for the solubility X. Now, whatever number you get there, the only twist is you gotta multiply it by two because the hydroxide will be twice that number. And from there, you can use 14 plus log hydroxide. You could also do Kw divided by hydroxide equals hydronium and then minus log of hydronium, blah, blah, blah. But either way, uh, at the end of the day, 10.35. Now here's the 4x cubed, x times 2x quantity squared is where the 4x cubed comes from. So KSP divided by four and the cubed root, the one third power will give you the solubility. Hydroxide is twice that number. And that's a weird thing on this one, definitely. But then you can do hydronium and then pH, or you could go 14 plus log 2.2 times 10 to the minus four. And pH will be greater than seven. Questions on that? This is a question that chemists get a lot. We've got two solutions, mixing them together, will you see a solid? KSP, lead chloride, lead to chloride. This is a yes or no, all right? You got two choices. You can do it a couple different ways on this problem. C, do you think this is gonna form? Yes or no? Outstanding. <clears throat> There's a couple ways you could solve this, all right? The classic chemist way, as I call it, is using Q, all right? Q looks just like K, so in this case, it would be the lead two plus times the chloride squared. So you could put this number in times this number squared, and you'll get a number. And you compare it to the K, all right? If your Q is less than K, no solid. On the other hand, if your Q is greater than K, then you will have a solid. 
but you don't have to use Q if Q makes you nervous. And I talked to somebody recently, this was the case, and that's okay. Uh, KSP equals lead times chloride squared. So what you can do is like solve for the lead required to make a precipitate when you have this much chloride. So you take this number and divide it by chloride squared to get a number. If your lead is greater than that, you would see a solid, but if it was less than that, you wouldn't. And either way is totally fine. Um, classic chemist way uh, is how I did it. You end up with a Q, which is quite a bit less than your K. All right, 1.2 times 10 to the minus seventh is less than 10 to the minus five. So that means no solid. But again, you could also solve for the lead ion that's needed to make a solid or the chloride, whatever works for you. Questions on that? KF formation constants are another type of equilibrium constant that we looked at in this section. Now, KSPs, the solid is the reactant and the ions that go into it are products. KF is kind of the reverse, all right, where the complex ion is the product and whatever's needed to go into it is the reactants, all right? So see if you can figure out here <clears throat> what the correct formation constant reaction is. Now, one little hint is that almost always KFs are net ionic equations. They're not uh, including all of the ions, just the relevant ones. So see if you can look up there and find which one of those that would best represent. Very cool. All right, so these crazy complex ions, weird combinations, usually a Lewis acid metal center and Lewis bases outside of that. And we'll talk about that more here in a, little, in a week or in a couple days. But anyway, the complex ion is this thing right here. And the complex ion is going to be the product. So well, in the KSPs, the interesting part was the reactant. These are always going to be the product, all right? And then whatever you need to go into making this is going to be the reactants. So there's six cyanides and each cyanide is minus one. So that's why this is overall minus three. There's a chromium plus three inside there. So this one will definitely be answer E. Um, the pieces that go into it will always be ions or, or like water, ammonia, stuff like that. You won't have weird solids like this one right here. Um, <clears throat> this one I believe is a balanced reaction, but it includes all the other pieces which aren't usually included when it comes to the complex ions. You just want the, the business of the reaction, if you will. Any questions on that? Okay, here's the reaction. We've got some entropy values. And the question is, what's the overall entropy of this reaction? Now, like a lot of these problems, it's gonna be thermodynamic products minus thermodynamic reactants. So in this problem, it's the entropy of products minus the entropy of the reactants. If there's more than one mole, multiply your value by two or three or whatever. See if you can figure out what the right answer is.
Excellent. So a lot of these problems, some kind of products minus some kind of reactants, these are entropies. So it'll be the entropy of the products minus the entropy of the reactants. Uh, you never have to know any of these values. I will give them to you. Uh, the delta H and delta G's for the elements are zero, but everything else, especially entropy, will have non-zero numbers. Remember, the only time the entropy is zero are those perfect crystals at zero Kelvin, which is like never. But anyway, on this problem, then you would take the entropy of CO2 plus two times chlorine, all right, so two times this number, and you would subtract the CCL4 and the O2. So it just comes down to having fun with math. If you got answer C, pat yourselves on the back, um, plug and chug, this would be an entropy favored reaction, all right. Uh, and that kind of makes sense. You're going from two moles of reactant to three moles of product. That's good. Also, you're going from a liquid and a gas to three moles of gas. And remember that gases always have more entropy than liquids, and liquids have more entropy than solids. So anytime you can follow that chain, you should see an increase in entropy. Any questions? All right, same kind of problem, all right? This is delta G, all right? These kind of delta G kind of problems. But if you look here, I have not included a delta G for O2. What's the value of delta G and delta H for that matter for elements in their standard states? Good, I see you doing the zeros, well done. Zero, all right? So I wasn't trying to be a jackass or anything. I just, uh, these elements in their pure states are zero. See if you can figure out uh, what this value is going to be. So again, delta G products minus delta G reactants, multiply the water by two because you have two of them. The O2 is not listed because oxygen is an element and the elements in their standard states have delta G and delta H, by the way, equal to zero. Uh, the overall value here comes out to be answer E. Nice job. Uh, and that's good. This is the reaction we use when we do a Bunsen burner because the natural gas, which is basically what we have, is essentially methane. And methane burns really well in oxygen to make CO2 and water. Uh, it's a reaction that occurs, so we would expect delta G to be a negative number, all right? If delta G was a positive number, we'd be in trouble because positive delta Gs are the ones that don't go usually. Uh, so this is good, this is spontaneous. We would expect this reaction to go. Question. Here's an example where I want you to calculate delta G using delta H and delta S values. So we're gonna use the Gibbs equation, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Uh, make sure that you use the same kind of energy. So you can see delta H is in kilojoules, S is in joules. Make sure you convert one to the other. See what you find.
Outstanding. Um, delta S is almost always joules per Kelvin, so make sure you turn Celsius to Kelvin. Uh, make sure you turn joules to kilojoules or kilojoules to joule, either way. Uh, the answer for delta G is usually in kilojoules, so I usually convert delta S to kilojoules, but you can do whatever you want. Either way, you all took care of business. Answer uh, B right there is the right one. If you've ever been uh, in the woods and you need to make a flare to someone, a lot of times that's from a magnesium source. It's very bright, lots of energy release. Uh, this is very exothermic, negative delta H, but entropy doesn't really like this reaction, all right? Because anytime you go from a gas into a solid and one and a half moles to one moles, entropy's not into this. However, at this temperature, this is still a reaction that goes, which is cool. Anytime you've got negative delta G, it's gonna be spontaneous. This is enthalpy driven. Any questions? We have time for just one more question. We've got a question with reaction. Delta H is positive, delta S is positive. And what can you say about the spontaneity, the delta G for this reaction? We've got four different possibilities. See if you can figure out which one would be Are rocking it, singing my song, loving it. Anyway, in this problem, we have a delta H which is positive. It is not enthalpy favored. All right, enthalpy when it's negative, that means it's enthalpy favored. This is not enthalpy favored. But delta S is positive. Positive delta S means entropy likes this reaction. This reaction is entropy favored. So you've got entropy in for it, enthalpy against it. So what that means here, if positive delta S times negative T makes this whole part there negative, and that makes delta G want to be negative, be spontaneous. But delta H is positive. Positive delta H makes delta G want to be positive. So we've got a fighting here of the two parts. So as you all saw here, this reaction will be product favored, i.e. delta G will be negative at quote unquote high temperatures. Because when T delta S is able to overpower delta H, then you'll get a negative delta G. So high quote unquote temperatures would be the place here. And high is very relative. It could be 5,000 Kelvin and it could be 50 Kelvin. But above that temperature is when your reaction's gonna go and below it is when it won't go. Questions on that? Okay, this was not the full review I had intended, but this is the only day we have for the review, so I'm really sorry. If you wanna see the full review, if you go to mhchem.org slash v slash z dot htm, you will see the whole version from YouTube, and you can fast forward to the parts and stuff like that if you want to. Uh, no big deal. If you haven't turned in your quiz, if you could do that for me, that would be awesome. Any questions? Have a great day.